Hi, everybody. Um, this is John Rood from Perceptual, We're back with another great discussion about um, AI and its implications in the workplace, and in particular, the legal implications. And I am thrilled today to be joined by Anthony May, uh, who's an attorney from the firm of Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. Welcome, Anthony. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was my pleasure. We're going to have a super fun discussion today. Um, the The goal is to make a lot of this, these developments, I think, in the AI world um, really accessible to HR leaders, to um, to executives, um, to internal legal folks. Um, so I think your background is going to be really great for that. I wanted to start. Um, I'd love if you just kind of give a, an introduction as to your, you know, yourself, your background, and your firm, and and the work that you're doing in the AI and uh, in the HR worlds. Happy to. So I am a, an attorney at Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. I've been here for about seven years. Um, we are primarily based in the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area, but we do a lot of litigation um, across the country. Um, and we are first and foremost a litigation firm. So in any any way, shape, or form, if you're going to court, we're we're the firm that can handle it. Um, we've got really skilled lawyers here. Um, but over the last, you know, since our inception, I think in the 90s, um, we've been around for a long time. One of our biggest focuses has always been um, social justice issues, public interest oriented issues. Um, and my practice specifically, I do a lot of that in the employment context um, and particularly representing people with disabilities. Um, and so that's one of the big focuses of my practice is representing clients with disabilities who have barriers imposed on them um, in the employment context. That's an amazing background. Um, thanks for thanks for doing that work. And I, I wanted to dive in there because that's a discussion I don't think that we've brought adequately to to our own audience. Um, so last year, as you're certainly aware, and our audience may or may not be aware, um, the kind of the when the EEOC first started to dip its toes specifically into discussing AI, they put out this release that basically said, and, and I'll let you uh, talk more about it, but that, I guess I, I would introduce it as it was in relation from uh, the from the uh, American with Disabilities Act. Um, hiring of um, folks with disabilities and AI tools. So I'd love if you could just start at a high level. So what is what is EEOC's interest here? What are you seeing out there? And for you know, as for us as HR practitioners, you know, we're we're trying to get this right. We're trying to do the right things. What are the things that HR leaders should be watching out for specifically around AI and folks with disabilities? Yeah, of course. So I mean. When we talk about AI, it's become such this popularized term now. It's this hot buzz, you know, buzzword that's used. But AI has been around for so long. I mean, we have been using it in the employment context for years. Uh, employers have been using it. And so what we've seen more recently emerging is the use of AI and primarily in two, I think, specific areas. And that's in the hiring process and in the employment um, review and retention and promotional process. And so what we see now is these technologies being used more often to kind of streamline those processes, make it more efficient for an employer, particularly with larger employers. It gives you an opportunity to, for example, go through uh, resumes a lot quicker um, or assess somebody's productivity. The problem with that is that AI can be used sometimes intentionally and most of the time, but most of the time not intentionally, um, it can have a disparate impact. And so what we, we talk about in the legal world is these disparate impact claims. While you might have a tool that is used and designed to be very objective, it can still have impacts on a particular group of people. And when we see, particularly with people with disabilities, um, AI can sometimes not understand or compensate for those disabilities. And so what do I mean by that? Well, so particularly in the hiring process, you've got um, AI creating job postings. So, you know, chat GPT is the, is the new fad and everybody loves chat GPT, right? Um, but it can be used in a way. So if you're creating a job posting and you tell chat GPT, I need you to create a job posting for an entry level, um, you know, program analyst, data analyst, you might get something that looks great. Um, but in the law, we talk about things called the essential functions of the job. And when you're talking about a, a person with a disability, can they, with or without reasonable accommodations, perform the essential functions of the job? And if they're not hired for a position because a you know a job posting says that X, Y, and Z are an essential function, but really they're not, and they're being excluded from that job because an employer thinks, well, they have this disability, they can't do this, therefore they're not qualified for the job, that's discrimination under the American with, Dis with Disabilities Act. And so those are the kinds of ways that AI can be used um, in a way that can eventually discriminate against people. Um, another 
another um, way that we see AI being used is through evaluating resumes. Um, and so, it, for example, if you've got AI being used to screen through resumes and you get hundreds of thousands of different resumes, the AI is being used to uh, assess those resumes based on people who have been in those positions and succeeded in those positions. Well, when the AI tool is being fed information on what does it look like to be successful, and if you are being successful and you happen to be a middle-aged straight white man, and that is all of the information being fed to the system, it's going to screen out people um, with disabilities. It's going to screen out women. It's going to screen out um, people who are non-white. And a famous example of that is in 2018, Amazon actually stopped using an AI system that was uh, systematically screening out women applicants, female applicants. Um, and so, but it, when we're looking further than that, um, for application purposes, a lot of time there's uh, virtual testing or virtual uh, interviews that are conducted through AI systems. Um, and they, those are looking for specific reactions, specific facial um, expressions, things like that. Um, and when that happens, if you are a person with a disability who doesn't have control, let's say you're a person with cerebral palsy and you don't have control over your, your facial expressions or you don't have contr neurological control, AI might see that as, oh, this isn't a good, this isn't a good uh, applicant. This isn't somebody who's going to fit the job description. Um, that is discrimination. And so what applicants need to be aware of and what employers need to be aware of is you have to provide them notice that AI is being used and you have to give them an opportunity to request a reasonable accommodation or in other words, a different way to be assessed on those same kind of qualifications. Um, and same thing really kind of applies to evaluation. So if you're looking at somebody's, uh, if somebody is in the workplace performing and you're looking back at well, how have they they performed? Are they, you know, should they be up for a promotional opportunity? Should we fire them? Um, you've got to take into account if, if it's somebody with a disability and maybe their productivity is impacted by that disability, you've got to consider that. And AI doesn't always do that. Um, and so those are just kind of some of the ways that AI can be used in the employment context that can have a disparate impact. Yeah, those are really good examples. Um, so let's say uh, let's say if I, i'm an i'm an hr manager and let's say i'm you know i'm aware of these issues generally and you know we've we've all been trained on how to think about um you know providing reasonable accommodation and you know be on the right side of ada um it seems like ai in in some ways has thrown a wrench into this where now there are more concerns in some ways it's just the same laws and they're just being applied to a new set of tools. So I guess if you if you take your legal hat, but also put on kind of like your your HR leader hat, if you were running, you know, a, a, a midsize HR department, how do you start thinking about those issues um, related to ADA? Like what should you actually do as you, you know, evaluate tools, evaluate methodologies? Um, what steps should we be taking? Yeah, I think that is such a great point. And that it is that we have these laws on the books. They are out there. Um, they exist. And it, we're not reinventing the wheel here. All we are saying is, here's a new emerging technology, and you've got to look at, look at it through the lens of the laws that we have, the ADA being one of them, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights of, Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination in employment generally um, for uh, you know a number of protected classes, including sex um, gender, uh, you know, all, all of those different things. Um, but then we also have things like the, um, the age, uh, discrimination and employment act, uh, which is actually a vehicle that has been used by, um, some recent lawsuits to file claims. Uh, particularly there's this, uh, case out there called real women in trucking who filed an EEOC complaint against, uh, Facebook or meta stating that meta was actually systemically not providing job postings to uh, female truck drivers. And so they weren't even getting these postings through AI. And so that was a discriminatory, their, their claim is that that discriminated against them and prevented them from getting job opportunities. So what, you know, putting on kind of an HR hat, I will say, and I will give a plug for the Society of Human Resource Management um, is a great, great resource. They have a lot of great tools and they're very up to date on how AI is being used in the employment context uh, they know a lot about the the laws that are percolating among the states out that are out there right now. So it's a great resource, I think, particularly from a human resources uh, vantage point. But when we're looking at what should we be doing, what should we be keeping an eye out for, particularly from a company's perspective, is looking at how are particularly federal agencies looking at AI and applying 
AI, the use of AI through these legal lenses. So you mentioned earlier, and I think it's a great starting point, is the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission. They have issued a lot of guidance on how AI is used um, and how it can be used in a discriminatory uh, way and things that employers should be on the lookout for. So they have uh, particularly some, some guidance on the ADA, um, and particularly gives a lot of different examples. It gives kind of a, a general overview of what the ADA requires, uh, but also gives examples of how um, the use of AI can have discriminatory impacts. Very recently, uh, I think within just the last week, they have uh, issued similar guidance with respect to Title VII, which is the general, more general employment um, statute that prohibits discrimination in employment. Um, so always looking at what the EEOC is interested in, how they are interpreting things. While it doesn't have the rule of law, so to speak, it is very good guidance that that employers can look at. Um, another another uh, kind of great tool that could be used for employers is um, the White House Blueprint on AI, which was something that the Biden administration released in 2022. And it really does provide a good roadmap for how AI should be used in a variety of contexts, but also specifically in the employment context. It references some of the EEOC guidance. Also, the Department of Justice has issued similar guidance. And there are other federal agencies um, that are out there. I believe the EEOC just announced a uh, kind of a efforts to coordinate with the Department of Justice and a few other um, federal agencies so that their efforts on kind of combating discrimination and in, in the way AI is used in employment are all kind of in lockstep with one another. Um, so those are some resources, but familiarizing yourself with the general um, ADA guidance, uh, Title VII guidance, the ADEA, um, that those sorts of things are all things that employers should really be on the lookout and keeping abreast of because this is a you know a rapidly evolving um, kind of legal landscape, and we're all just trying to figure it out as we go. Yeah, I, that's that's really good advice. Um, so as we as we do that, as we do exactly what you said, which is figure out as we go. Let's let's think about a you know a challenge that I know that a lot of folks that are listening are, are going to be going through, which is you know they you know they're they're used to applying these existing laws, ADA and Title VII, et cetera. Um, Let's say that you are an HR leader and you're trying to evaluate the use of a tool and, you know, you get it from a vendor. Um, you're, you know, you, of course, are not uh, are not uh, a party to, you know, the code that underlies the tool. Um, you probably wouldn't be interested in reading through the code, even even um, if you were a, a party to it. Um, the vendor always says in every in every vendor I've ever said that's, that uses AI, it says, well, this is this is going to reduce bias. Right. Um, so that's a good claim. And without knowing if that's true or not, um, how do we start to think about that as an HR leader? So like, what are the steps um, that we should be taking as leaders when we say we want to use a new tool? Um, if we go to Anthony, like, what's he going to counsel us to do to make sure that we're that we're using the, these tools in a, in a way that conforms to uh, Title VII, ADA, et cetera? Yeah. So I think first and foremost, what, what, what needs to be very clear is that if you are an employer and you are contracting with a vendor to provide these services, that contract doesn't insulate you from liability, right? Title VII, ADA, all of that stuff requires you as the employer, puts the onus on you to make sure you're implementing it in a correct way. So even if a vendor tells you, look, we're great, everything is fine, we're doing it right, you can't trust that. So you, I think in terms to respond to your question, you need to be able to ask a lot of questions and you want to know more and more and more about how the tool is being used, how it is you know, reaching certain decisions, and one, I think one challenge particularly for that is what we call this black box issue, right? That AI is sometimes used where even the designers and the vendors who create and design these tools don't even know why AI does what it does. And so getting kind of underneath that black box issue and understanding it more, the more you can understand how the process goes, how it's reaching these decisions and how it's getting to the outputs that it's getting, uh, the more you can understand whether or not you are potentially susceptible for liability for bias, right? So that is a big, huge thing is making sure you're constantly talking with your vendor. And um, I think the, the other biggest thing is really performing these routine audits, right? And that is something we see particularly in one of the newest laws, um, when I think one of the first laws in the country, the local state laws, is New York City has just recently passed a law that is about to take effect. Um, that limits the use of AI in employment if it's going to have discriminatory impacts and also requires routine audits of these systems. And so 
talking with your vendors, consistently doing routine audits to ensure that um, that you are not doing things like unnecessarily or even you know intuitively without any sort of intent, um, having some sort of outputs that could be viewed as a disparate impact or could be viewed as having a discriminatory impact. So having those routine audits, working closely with your vendors and not being afraid to ask questions and push back, I think is really, really important because you don't want to be caught in a position where you're told by your vendor, everything is a-okay. And the next thing you know, you've got a class action lawsuit against you. Well, obviously you want to avoid that. Yeah, I think it's great advice. And, you know, one of the challenges that a number of, of our clients have is, you know, they come to us because they want to start uh, the compliance process for the the New York law that you'd referenced, New York Local Law 144, um, which we, we we write a lot about. And I know that you've written about recently as well. Um, New York Local Law 144 is quite prescriptive in, in, in what's re required, right? So among other things, we have to perform the audits, which you were just mentioning, and those have to be done on an annual basis. And I think that one of the challenges that um, people are running into is, let's say that they they do that, great, like that, that that's hard work, but if you get it done, like it's clear what, what you need to do. But for the federal regulations, for Title VII, for what EEOC does, it's not really quite clear, like, what's required, right? So so New York says you have to do this audit and produce this result. Here's the exact chart you need to do. You need to do it once a year. EEOC says like, well, you better not discriminate, uh, you know, period, right? So how should you think about that? Like if you are, it, 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 let's say that you're, you know, you're located in California, so you're, you don't have to do the things for local law 144 in New York, but you have to do something for the EEOC. What is that something that you need to do? Yeah, so it, it's a great point, right? And we, we're, again, at this very kind of starting point about how are things going to be regulated? What are the requirements? And really the answer is we don't quite know yet. Um, but what we can't, what we do know is that we have these general laws and things like California are good guiding posts. So even though, uh, or I'm sorry, New York are good guiding posts, right? So even if you're not in New York City, but you see that New York City has this more developed law, you can look at that as a guiding post for, for California to say, look, New York is requiring this. If we, uh, it's probably likely that the, the state of California is going to adopt similar regulations. In fact, I know that in 2018, um, the uh, California passed the C California Consumer Privacy Act um, and is now just now starting to update its guidance on that uh, that act so it can start kind of considering what do employers need to look at when they're ter in terms of automated decision making, AI technology, stuff like that. So really, it's just if you as a gold standard, if you are an employer who really wants to do the right thing and wants to make sure you're uh, totally compliant, start looking at how some of these local laws are developing what are some of the standards that th that are going to be applied there um and so if you just want to make sure that you're fully protected those can those kind of emerging state local laws can really provide a good roadmap for what you might need to uh, do down the line um but you know we don't have right now we don't have a lot of cases out there interpreting federal laws that say this is what is required so it is you know we can kind of put together some mishmash of what this law says and what this law says and kind of get a, a good roadmap of what we expect. But until we kind of test this and until employers, you know, you know, unfortunately, I think there are some employers that out there that are going to do the bare minimum until they're told otherwise. Um, and so I, I would just offer that if you are an employer, don't be that person. Don't be the one who's going to just say, I'll wait till somebody, till I get a federal lawsuit and I get slapped with a, you know, a consent decree or a preliminary injunction or something like that. You don't you don't want to face that, right? So if you, as much as you can get ahead, look at how some of these emerging laws are coming out, what the requirements are within them, and come up with your own standards so that you know that you're not, uh, you know, out there, you know, doing things that really are going to have a discriminatory impact. Yeah, that sounds like great advice. Um, are you seeing a lot of your, uh, your, you know, your clients on the corporate side? Are people asking you about this, or does it feel like it's still like early days in terms of um, people knowing what they should be doing? Yeah, so I don't, um, I don't, in my practice, represent um, employers typically. I'm typically a plaintiff's attorney, right? So right. I represent uh, people who are impacted. But I will say, I'm actually getting ready to do a presentation in our state bar association with a colleague who does represent um, organizations, and they are very much interested in what does this mean, right? So you should be talking for for the folks paying attention to this at home 
Um, if you're an employer and you're looking for some guidance or you're thinking, is this something I should should pay attention to? The answer is emphatically yes. You should be paying attention to it. You should be talking to your general counsel um, or your employment counsel about what this these concepts mean. What are the things that we should be looking for? What should we be doing? How should we be holding vendors' feet to the fire to make sure that what we are doing is in line with the law so we don't you know get slapped with a lawsuit down the road? Nice. That's yeah. That's great advice. Um, well, Anthony, that was a that was a whirlwind of information. I want to make sure that we uh, we respect the time limit that I offered you at the beginning of our call. So um, I want to thank you again um, for uh, for being here. We will put the put the link to you, um, your company site, to your LinkedIn, if you like, under the show great. notes here. I think we're supposed to say under the under the show notes, right? When we when we do LinkedIn, yeah, okay. like, listen, like, subscribe, um, so folks can get a get a hold of you um, if they like to be in contact. So thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate you joining us today. Greatly appreciate the opportunity and thanks for all the good work you're doing.